get up. Okay, I'll start again. Each morning when I get up, I make myself a cup of tea. You might call it a ritual. After the tea is steeped, and I pull the tea bag out, I put in a little bit of sugar because I'm not quite sweet enough yet. I know that's a surprise to most of you. And then I pour milk into the cup. And what was a dark, dark brown, almost black, turns into this chestnut color that is just wondrous. And before I lay the spoon aside, I take up the cup and I bring it to my lips and I take the first sip. Bliss. I mean, even as I stand before you this morning, I remember my cup of tea this morning. I can, I can hear the kettle click off and pouring the water into the cup. Can, you, you probably can remember too. It's a moment I cherish every morning because it's in those moments that I take that cup to a table or to a chair and I open God's word and I reflect and think about the day that's coming. All this got me thinking. As these past two years have unfolded, Instead of the image of a beautiful cup of tea being stirred, I feel like, like what we were given was a, a bottle of Coke that somebody had dropped on the ground and then not told us. And then they brought it to us and we opened it up. Don't worry, baby, you're all okay. <laughs> and you know what's going to happen, don't you? It's going to go everywhere. Coke will be everywhere. And, and, and then we have to walk through it, and it sticks to our shoes and to, to everything. And, and well, it's just a mess. What do you think? Does that, that better describe this last couple of years? But as I was reflecting on that image, I was, I was, I was thinking there's one problem with this, because I don't think it was the year that was shaken, really, that caused the problem. I think it was us. We're the ones whose lives have, in a sense, been turned upside down, whose routines and plans have been upended. These past two years have been crushing in so many ways, from the pandemic to the lockdowns to the unrest to the rising prices to the mask mandates and the, you know, the, the vaccine requirements. I mean, these, these last couple of years have been hard. Everywhere. And while it seems like maybe the clouds might be lifting, there's this in the back of your head, what variant is going to be next? And if it's not that, there's the rising energy costs, right, Tony? And then the rising inflation, there is the Ukraine, and well, there's the, the Olympics in China and all of the, I mean, just everything. We are being shaken. And I guess the question is, what will come out? What will be revealed in us in all of this shaking? Well, that brings me to the passage that you've just heard. I don't know about you, but, but next to any scripture text on prayer, this is maybe one of the most difficult ones to hear or to, to grasp or to embrace. Love your enemies? I mean, come on. Pray for those who persecute you. Yeah, that's a really good idea. And in this phrasing, we in, in that phrasing, we even have this idea of praying and, and loving your enemies. It's kind of put together. I mean, this is beyond difficult. We, we, we could go on, but the passage is pretty clear, isn't it? The call to love is not an easy one. It's not a call to only those who will respond in love to us. It's a call to love those who choose to make our lives a living hell. How in the world are we supposed to do that? And if you're thinking, well, you know, we just kind of, it's just, just a few little words in the, in the New Testament. Maybe we can just kind of push it aside and, and work on some other things first. The truth is, these are the words of our very Lord Jesus from a sermon that he gives. And the, the, they demand action. They demand response. And what they demand is, well, it's jarring, isn't it? Now, there are lots of things that I think we should learn from these words. 
none more important than this. The love that Jesus requires is not some sentimental word of affirmation that we're called to give. It's clear that this love is demonstrated love, love in action. Amen. If someone slaps you on the cheek, what does it say? Hand them the other. Now, I have to be honest with you, I really struggled with this as a teenager. I only ever got into one fight in my high school years. I was attending Wandsworth Boys School in London. And I was known for being compliant. In other words, I was known for being a kid who would turn the other cheek. I was trying to live up to this ethic. I was trying to do the right thing, I thought. I was trying to live out what Jesus is saying here. And I would, I would do whatever anybody else would ask me to do. Because I didn't want to ruffle feathers. I certainly didn't want to challenge anyone until that one day. The other boy knew my propensity to give in and to do whatever anybody else wanted me to do, wanted them to do. And he came to me and he demanded that I give up my place in the queue. I was first in line to get into that classroom to choose my seat. We were choosing seats that day. And, and I knew if I was first in line, I'd get the first shot. Well, he wanted that place. And he told me to move out of the way. As I began to move, something happened inside of me. <laughs> I, I don't know why I did what I did, but he pushed me. And the next thing I knew, I was standing there with my fist clenched, him with a bloody nose on the floor, and the headmaster, God bless him, having just walked around the corner, seeing it all. Well, let's just say I didn't get the seat that I wanted. And the truth is, I didn't want to sit down for a little while, if you get my drift. <laughs> but I remember thinking I was so thankful because the headmaster did not call my parents and tell them that I was expelled and to come get me right then, but said that, well, he just told them what had happened. I don't recall anything that happened at home that night. They say you suppress <laughs> bad memories, right? <laughs> I don't remember. I do remember that I didn't relish that journey home. I was rehearsing my lines, much like the prodigal, <laughs> as I went home. Now, you may be thinking, well, what has that got to do with what Jesus said? I, I really think that, that we've taken those words to turn the other cheek in a way that I'm not, I'm not sure that they were intended to be understood. This is not some call for us to, to be weak followers of Jesus, who just let people walk all over us. This is fundamentally about a call to love, which, if we're honest, will often lead to sacrifice, right? Maybe you're thinking, well, what's the deal? Well, I, I, turned, I turned my cheek many times as a young teenager. But can I tell you, there was not always love in my heart as I did it. In fact, there were many times when I loathed those who were reaching out and touching me, if you get my drift. There were times when I was defiantly standing up on the inside, even though I was cowering on the outside. Times when I was praying for their demise, for bad things to happen to them. Now, I'm not suggesting that actions don't matter, but because Jesus says, out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. What I am suggesting is that our actions should be actions of love, not some passive defiance. But Jesus is clearly in these words calling us to love. Or as it says in verse 36, to be merciful as your heavenly father is merciful. In one translation, it says to be compassionate as your father is compassionate. Some have suggested that in these words are really the heart of the gospel. And I'm kind of inclined to agree. In fact, in the verse just before these words, those words that, that I just repeated for us, we're told that when we do this, when we are merciful as our heavenly father is merciful, 
that we are acting the way that the children of the Most High act. At least that's how it's translated in the, in the Common English Bible. In other words, we behave like God's children when we live lives of mercy towards even our enemies. Now, of course, it's easy for us to kind of say, okay, well, that sounds great. Move on. <laughs> it's easy not to reflect on all that that means, but, but Jesus is keen for us to do more than just understand this. He's explicit in his speech. He really means for us to show mercy as he shows mercy. Thankfully, we see that on display even in the narrative. In, in Luke 5 and Luke 6. Remember in Luke 5, this is prior to, to this occasion where Jesus is preaching. He calls Levi. We call him many times Matthew to follow him, right? And Levi, Matthew invites, invites him to his home for a, a great banquet, a party that he's throwing. And, he, and of course, Levi invites his friends. And who are his friends? Well, they're mostly a crowd of other sin, ta sin, sinners, tax collectors. Well, that's what the religious leaders call them, sinners. And I want you to notice what Jesus did. He goes, doesn't he? He doesn't not go because it might offend the Pharisees. He does the right thing. Maybe you're thinking, well, well, we all know what's going to happen from now on. He's going to steer clear of those, of those Pharisees. But you know what happens? In Luke 7, those Pharisees, one of those Pharisees invites Jesus to his house to dinner. A dinner where Jesus receives no customary greeting. In fact, they're really offending Jesus. And yet still, Jesus doesn't exclude those who are seeking to upend his ministry, to kill him, to ridicule him. He, he is constant in his actions, his love. And then in Luke 6, verse 6, Jesus goes to the synagogue, and there's a man with a shriveled hand there. And the tension in this moment is there because there's a group of Pharisees and teachers who are standing on the sidelines watching to see if Jesus will, will he, will he break the rules? Will he heal on the Sabbath? They look, they're looking to accuse Jesus. What does Jesus do? Does he say to the man, you know, meet me out back after the service? Does he say, let's chat tomorrow? No. He asks if it's right to do good or to do evil, to save a life or destroy it. There's no weakness in his response. He does the right thing. He loves this man, bringing healing to, the, to his body in spite of the troubles that he'll bring on himself. You see, this call to love our enemies, those who are in opposition to us, this call to be merciful as our Heavenly Father is merciful, is not a call to simply do what, what they want us to do, to acquiesce to their demands, to keep the peace, to keep them from getting more upset. It is a much higher call. It is the call to love. And as I had said before, often that call requires a sacrifice. I mean, let's face it, the actions of Jesus certainly did for him. And yet, in everything that Christ did, love was paramount. We're going to come back to that in a moment. But, but first, let's, let's think about love. That word doesn't mean what we often think it means, does it? I mean, our music suggests all sorts of things about love. Mostly that it's fickle. Let's face it, we, we have some rather messed up ideas about what love really is. Love, a secondhand emotion? What does that even mean? We think of love as a fleeting. It's, it's almost as if love is more accident than decision. We speak of falling in love, like it just kind of happens, like falling off a curve. <coughs> and to be fair, while we can fall for someone, <coughs> Love is so much more than an emotion that leaves us tongue-tied. It's a decision that requires a commitment, a resolve to always seek the best of the other. So this call to love our enemies, this call to love those who, are, who annoy us, those who come against us, is not a call to let them off the hook. It's not a call to make have warm, fuzzy feelings about them. This is a call to do the hard thing, 
You see, Jesus' response on that Sabbath was not just good for that man with the shriveled hand. It was also good for those misguided teachers, wasn't it? <laughs> All this leads to a question. What does that look like? I mean, if you look at the text, did you notice the love of which Jesus speaks, that it's a love without reciprocity? I mean, it's clear from the text. He says, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. But he goes on, he says, but love your enemies, do good to them and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. In doing this, you'll be children of the most high. Jesus is calling us to be kind to the ungrateful and the wicked, to be merciful just as the father is merciful. Remember the, the par parable of the prodigals of the good Samaritan? I mean, we certainly see that there in that story. We, we have a tendency to forget, don't we, that the Good Samaritan was the sworn enemy of Israel. You know, I imagine if that, if that Jew laying there in that ditch on that road to, between Jew, Jerusalem and Jericho, if he'd been half alive, he would have rejected the help of that Good Samaritan. But when the Torah story, we're told that he was left for dead, wasn't he? So he ends up being helped. In this story, Jesus suggests that our neighbor can be your enemy. And that loving here involves more than platitudes, but in, in, instead highly provocative actions like binding and anointing and housing. I mean, love is certainly not fickle in, these, in that example, is it? I go back to that final line in our reading, be merciful just as your father is merciful. I mean, if we know anything about our God, it's that, that he is a God of mercy. I mean, remember Jonah? I mean, the whole reason that Jonah gets on a, on a ship to Tarshish, the whole reason was because I just knew what you would do, God. He knew that his God was merciful. He knew that he'd let them off the hook, that he'd forgive them, that he'd give the sworn enemy of Israel another chance, that he would show them mercy. And there's really no clearer demonstration of this than in the life of Jesus himself. I think one of the reasons that Jesus calls us to come around this table is mercy. Because in, in the cross, we see almost in technical the mercy, grace, and love of God that is on, this, on display. In his broken body and shed blood, we see Christ living out the ethic that Jesus is proclaiming in these moments. Thank God he did. Because Jesus was nailed to a cross to, to suffer and to die. I mean, he'd done nothing wrong. He didn't deserve that punishment. And as he hung there, we're told that there were those who had sought his punishment, who continued to jeer him and to mock him, aren't we? But you remember the response of Jesus, don't you? He lifts up his head and he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. We think, oh, that, those, that sounds just like Jesus to say something like that. But you know, those words were more than just words. Because those words are only fulfilled through the sacrifice and the death of Christ. In saying those words, he was stretching his arms and dying for them. For those who were in enmity with God, opposed to him. You see, this call to love our enemies, this call to show mercy as God shows mercy, well, it's a profound, it's a profound call. <laughs> and I know what you're thinking, because I'm thinking it too. It's profoundly impossible. I mean, it's not in us.
Maybe that's the reason we need to come around this table again. That we might be reminded that we who were enemies with God have been brought near. That we have been loved and shown mercy and forgiven and grace. Because you know, the truth is only as we receive that love, only as we find ourselves immersed in that love, can we ever begin to hope to live out that ethic. Only in him, in fact, only him in us can do what we are being called to do. Many of you know Corrie Ten Boom, the story of her life. She spent time in the Nazi concentration camp watching her sister slowly die at the hands of this evil empire. And later in her life, as she has, was, was speaking, a former guard who had been in the concentration camp where she had been held was there in the service as she was sharing and talking about forgiveness. And he came to her, and do you know what he asked her? He asked her to forgive him. This is how the story goes. He comes up to her, he says, a fine message, Fraulein. How, how good it is to know that, as you say, all our sins are at the bottom of the sea. Tori says she remembered him. She was suddenly face to face with one of her captors. He said to her, you mentioned Raven's book, Brook, in your talk. I was a guard at Ravensbrook. Since that time, I have come to Christ. And I know that God has forgiven me for all the cruel things that I have done, that I did there. But I would like to hear it from your lips as well. Will you forgive me? And Corey said that she stood there. Betsy, her sister, had died in that place. Could he erase her slow, terrible death simply by asking? The soldiers just stood there, expectantly waiting for Corey to reach out a hand and to shake it. And she found herself in her heart wrestling with the most difficult thing that she had ever been called to do. Somewhere inside, she knew that she had to do it. Corey remembered that forgiveness is an act of the will, not an emotion. And she whispered a prayer, Jesus, help me. I can lift my hand. I can do that much. You supply the feeling. So she thrust out her hand and she shares that as she did, an incredible thing took place. The current started in the shoulder, it raced down her arm, sprang into her joint, into their joined hands. And then this healing warmth seemed to flood her whole being, bringing tears to her eyes as she said, I forgive you brother, with all my heart. How in the world? How in the world could she do that? That's, that's impossible. Except by the presence of God and his love in her heart. In a moment, we were going to come around this table. And we will share this sacrament again. And at this table, we will be confronted again by the wonderful mercy and love of God. And this, not in words, but in elements that remind us of a life poured out and broken for you and for me. This, this is a profound demonstration. This sacrament is a profound reminder of God's love for you, for me. Amen. And I wonder if we might receive that love again. Maybe you're thinking, well, why is it so vital? We know this. We've heard this before. Why do we need to hear it again? Well, remember the parable of the, of the unmerciful servant? In that, in that parable, the, this servant is forgiven this vast amount that, 
that he couldn't pay off in in a hundred lifetimes. He's forgiven this great debt. And yet, you remember what he does when he leaves the presence of the king? He doesn't go throw a party. He doesn't go out there going, yippee! I'm free at last! No. He goes and finds a guy who owes him a month's wages and almost throttles him by, and then throws him in prison. You ever wonder why in the world did he do that? Why would, why would he who had been forgiven so much act that way? I think one of the reasons is because he didn't really believe that he'd been forgiven. I mean, if I'd been forgiven that debt, I would hope that I would respond to those who are in my debt differently. Well, wait a minute. <laughs> I don't. I think one of the reasons that we often fail to show mercy is because we fail to remember that we have been shown great mercy. We fail to remember that our debts have been canceled. A debt that we could never repay. Go back to this bottle of Coke here. I think we all know what will happen when I open this bottle. Nathan's not going to be too happy cleaning up this floor. And if you're in front, you're probably a little, little worried. I thought about how to end this, this message. I mean, I could simply leave you with that, those words, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. I say, be merciful as, as your heavenly father is merciful. But what I want to do this morning is I want to call you to the table and I want to remind you that you have been forgiven a debt that you could never repay. And my prayer is that as you receive these emblems of his love poured out for you, his mercy, his grace, that that love would so fill your heart that that is what would come out. Amen. Maybe you see that as futile. And say, Pastor, you don't know how weak I am. You don't know my frailty. How prone to anger. True, I don't. But I know how weak I am. I know my frailty. But I also know this. We have this treasure in jars of clay Amen. to show that this all surpassing power is from God and not from us. We're hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. We're persecuted, but not abandoned. We're struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our bodies the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our bodies. May that be true. That's my prayer. Amen. That in our lives, Jesus would be revealed as we face disappointment, as we face struggle, as we face obstacles, as we face frustrations, as we come against those who seek to do us wrong. Now that will make a difference in our world. So let's come to the table again to receive his love poured out for us. As we prepare to come, we're, we're going to sing a wonderful hymn by Charles Wesley. The words of that hymn, I, I hope that, that as we sing them, that you don't just sing right through them, but that you <laughs> meditate on them. I, I'm especially touched. Do, do, do you remember the first stanza, the first verse? 
And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? And then there's this line, died he for me who caused his pain. For me who him to death pursued. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, should die for me? Oh, might we, even this morning, be confronted again with his love and his mercy and his grace. So let's sing these wonderful words and then we'll come to the table. <laughs>